Say hello. Good evening. Welcome to the uh, opening event of the third season of the Israel Association of Writers in English Zoom uh, series. Because tonight, I'm really happy to hear about this subject from a very different perspective, from a very different angle to Israeli writers who live abroad and write in English. Ayala Tabari and Omar Friedlander. Let me just introduce them very briefly and then they will take, a, take over. Ayala Tabari moved to Canada in her 20s and has been winning fiction awards ever since there for The Art of Leaving and The Best Place on Earth. Ayala teaches at the uh, MFA program in creative writing at the University of Guelph and uh, also at the Shandy Rudolph graduate track in creative writing at Baridan. If you really want to know more about uh, Ayelet after tonight, you can meet her uh, at Tel Aviv University uh, in, on May 11th giving the uh, annual Carmel lecture. Uh, so you can find out much more about her. Omel is more secretive. Uh, <laughs> Omel Friedlander was born in Jerusalem, grew up in Tel Aviv, earned a BA in, uh, in English literature from the University of Cambridge, uh, England, and then an, an MFA from Boston University, where uh, he was supported by the Saul Bellow Fellowship. Uh, his short stories have won numerous awards, and they've been published in the United States, in Canada, France, Israel. Uh, and I hope you're all on mute, because I'm going on it very shortly, because as they take over. Um, uh, Omel currently lives in New York. In New York. I get it. You'll tell us about it. Uh, why don't we begin with Ayelet, who is going to read for us, uh, and then Omil, and then we'll talk, and then we'll, they'll talk, and we'll all discuss this issue that I think really interests all of us, writing in English about Israel. Ayelet. Thank you so much, Karen, and um, thank you all for being here. I'm really glad to be here because uh, frankly, I don't know how I kind of missed uh, the existence uh, of this of this group, which um, should be a perfect fit for me. I do live in Tel Aviv now. I live in Yad Eliyahu. Uh, I moved back four years ago um, after 20 years in, in Canada. Um, so I have kind of the both perspective, I guess, at this point. Um, and yeah, I'm going to leave the talking uh, for a conversation, um, which I think would be more interesting, uh, but I'm going to read actually from the short stories because I felt like it was a better match for Omel uh, today, who, um, whose book of short stories I also happen to have here. And I'm gonna read from mine, which is the best place on earth. It's gonna be, 10 years in, in next year. I can't, I can't believe that happened. Um, and I'm gonna read from a story called The Poets in the Kitchen Window, just uh, the beginning, um, just the beginning of it, no preamble needed. The missiles started falling on Tel Aviv on the night of January 17th, a few hours after Operation Desert Storm began in Iraq. They had been prepared carrying their gas masks with them everywhere for weeks. Cardboard boxes with dangling straps like purses, which some girls in Uli's class had decked out with stickers and collages. At school, they had run drills with everyone sitting in a row on the floor, leaning against the wall, elbowing each other and giggling. None of them had ever sat in shelters, had ever even heard a siren. The only war in their lifetime had been the Lebanon War, which erupted in 1982 when Uri was four and had never really ended. 
from images he saw on the news, Uri knew that people up north had sat up and had sat in shelters. New soldiers had died, even a classmate's brother. But in Ramat Gan, the suburban town where he lived, hours away from the border, it was sometimes easy to forget. When the first siren sounded, Uri thought it was a part of the dream. He had been dreaming about wars a lot lately. Dreams where he was taller and braver and Ashkenazi. His skin lighter, his eyes blue, like one of those black and white pictures of soldiers he had seen in history books. Tears glistening in their eyes after they'd liberated Jerusalem. As Uri watched the sepia movies his teacher had screened in history class, the stiff, clownish, fast-moving soldiers waving from tanks and mar marching in the streets. He wished he had been born earlier, back before independence, when the pioneers had built kibbutzim and paved roads and rebelled against the British, when soldiers cried at the Wailing Wall and there was a purpose, a greater meaning, a larger battle. It seemed like everything of significance had happened before he was born. In his last year of elementary school, he had written a poem about it titled Other Wars, which had won his school poetry contest, earning him publication in the school paper and a month of mockery from the boys in his grade who recited parts of it with a lisp and substituted the word fag every time war appeared in the poem. That first night, Uri sat on his parents' bed with his dad, their gas masks pressing red marks around their faces. Uri had fastened the straps so tight that his chin ached. They had sealed the room a few days earlier, covering the windows with heavy duty plastic sheeting and duct tape like the IDF had instructed on TV. The mask smelled of rubber, like a new toy and Uri could hear his breathing as though he were underwater. Then the first missile hit, and Uri's heart lurched in his chest like a jerked knee. His father, looking like a frightened giant ant, wrapped his arm around him and pulled him closer. Five or six more explosions echoed in the distance, sounding like fireworks on Independence Day or a fighter jet that had broken the sound barrier. And then one more, closer this time. The seventh floor apartment walls shuddered with the reverberation. Oi's body was tense, his jaw clenched, but it was the kind of fear that put things into proportion, making every other fear he'd ever felt of failing a test in school, of jumping headfirst into the swimming pool, of embar embarrassing himself in front of Avital Ginsberg, back when he used to like her, which he no longer did, seem trivial. It was the kind of fear that made him stronger, a man. The following day, Yasmin called. It was a cool, sunny morning, the air as crisp as broken glass, and Uri and his father sat on the couch in their living room, watching the IDF spoken, smoke, spokesman on TV. The missiles had fallen in and around Tel Aviv, the spokesman said. None of the missile heads was chemical and there were no casualties. He urged everyone to stay at home and keep calm. Then they cut to shots of panicked crowds lining up at Ben Gurion Airport. I'm coming home, Yasmin said. The line crackled and her words echoed faintly. Uri's heart gave a little start, surprise, delight, anticipation. When, he said, turning away from his father's outstretched arm. His dad reached over and pried the phone out of his hand. Don't come, he said. Everyone is leaving. If we had a place to go, we'd be leaving too. I'm coming. Uri could hear his sister's voice on the other line. And that's that. Thank you. Uh, I'll stop here uh, and let Omil uh, read from his wonderful book. Thanks. I, I really love that story. I remember reading it for the first time. Um, it's uh, great to, to be here and thanks for, for coming to listen. Um, so I'll read just the opening from my, uh, from the first story in my collection uh, called Jaffa Oranges. We are a fruitful, many branched and sprawling family. 
ranging from Yafo to Haifa, and our business is oranges. I will be 87 at the turn of the new millennium, and I own one of the last true Shamuti orange groves, where the fruit is sweet and thick. My four children, three sons and a daughter, work in finance and law, and my grandchildren, all nine of them, can't tell the difference between a Shamuti and a Mandarin. From time to time, they come visit the grove in Asharon, help pick the fruit, wrap it individually in wax paper, and pack it in crates, which are later sold at the farmer's market. I'm always reminded of a poem by Yudha Michai when I think of my children and my grandchildren. It's called Eyes, and I know it by heart. My eldest son's eyes are like black figs, for he was born at the end of the summer. And my youngest son's eyes are clear, like orange slices, for he was born in their season. And the eyes of my little daughter are round, like the first grapes. And all are sweet in my worry. And the eyes of the Lord roam the earth, and my eyes are always looking round my house. God's in the eye business and the fruit business. I'm in the worry business. When I stumble across the young woman wandering around the grove, I'm preparing for the spring. Since dawn, I've been clearing out the unripe fruit, clogging the irrigation canals. I'm wearing my tembel hat, its brim hardly covering my large ears, which stick out. My movements are slower than they used to be. The woman wearing a button-down blouse, blowing beige pants and sandals, is accompanied by one of my workers, an Arab man who guards the grove, whose hands are always clean and spotless, fingernails clipped and neat. The woman does not seem surprised to see me. In fact, she's been looking for me. She's starkly beautiful with radiant olive skin, dark tumbling curls, and black eyes under unusually large lids. She tells me she's the granddaughter of my childhood friend, Khalil Haddad, a Palestinian whose father owned one of the largest orange groves in Jaffa during the British mandate. I can see the resemblance immediately in her eyes. He had the very same one, dark as coal, heavy lidded, I try to control my breathing as we walk through the grove, the light golden on the plump fruit. Her hands cradle the oranges. She presses her ear to them as if they might whisper a secret. What does she know? What, does, what has Khalil told her? My heartbeat is rapid, my hands shake. I have not spoken Khalil's name aloud for years and years. None of my grandchildren know his name. The soft grass is spotted with fallen fruit. Buzzing bees flit from purple lemon flowers to white lime flowers. Lila explains that Khalil told her about me, his devo devoted childhood friend, his only Jewish friend, countless times. When her grandfather died several months before, she decided to come here to ask me about him. She loved him very much, but she feels like she doesn't know much about his past in Palestine before he lived in London, before the war, before Nakba. It wasn't an easy trip for me, Lila says. Despite her British passport, she tells me that she was interrogated by the border control officers for hours at the airport. And what did you tell them? That you were just going to talk to an old man about his oranges? It doesn't matter what I told them. I am Palestinian, so they were suspicious. I think I'll stop there. Thanks. I think we need more. <laughs> <laughs> we need more of that story. <laughs> uh, yeah, I could read a little more, or we, or we could start the, the conversation. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we can we can read a little more later. Yeah, I read a couple more paragraphs or another page. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can definitely one. I never saw Khalil after he departed with his family. So many Palestinians fled by sea and land after the heavy bombardments of Jaffa. The port was overwhelmed with refugees crowding small boats. The Haddad family, like the other orange growers, 
dismantled their water pumps and deserted their grove, carrying with them only a small portion of their belongings and handcarts. Jaffa was burning, the trees in the orchard were burning, the oranges were burning, and the flames spiraled up into the sky. And for days, ash floated in the air, blanketing the abandoned city in a haze. I don't like to think back to those moments. Khalid and I packed the oranges together into crates in your great grandfather's orchard. We wrapped each orange individually in wax paper. I pick an orange and withdraw a pocket knife, flick the blade open. The blade glints in the sun, and I see my own face reflected in it, splotched with cancer spots in a sprinkling of veins like the rootstocks of a tree. Without noticing, I've grown old. Rot sets quickly in an orange, infecting the entire fruit. The trick is to squeeze it firmly and listen to its sound. You can tell by the fermented smell that it's spoiled. But the orange in the palm of my hand is young, unblemished. I dissect it, peeling the thick skin in one long curly slab and offer her the naked fruit, coated in porous, bitter white tissue. She eats a segment, juice spilling down her chin and spits out a pip. I thought Jaffa oranges were meant to be seedless, she said. At the time for a Jew like me to be friends with a Palestinian like Khalil wasn't so strange. Under Ottoman rule, Jews and Palestinians carted sand together to make cement, toiled in orange groves and vineyards, tinkered in metalwork factories, ran seaside brothels, and oversaw the bride of the sea's crown jewel, Jaffa Harbor's booming export business, fleets of cargo vessels sailing around the world carrying citrus fruit. When Palestine changed hands from the Ottomans to the British, my life remained mostly unchanged. As a child, I spent most of my time in the packing house with Khalid, wrapping oranges and packing them in crates. It was a good job, monotonous, but not difficult. Every morning I walked with Khalid to the packing house, past the newspaper vendor selling copies of Palestine and Abu Lafia's bakery, where filo pastries were baking in large stone ovens, stopping by Abu Ahmad's, the tiny sweet shop, my favorite, st favorite spot for Khalva for many years before it burned down. Emils ambled lazily through Clock Square, their hooves clicking on the cobblestones. Khalid's father and the other landowners sat under the shade of palm trees in elegant white suits, drinking coffee from small glasses. Tell me about my grandfather, Lila says. Her voice is excited, like a little girl waiting to open a present. Her eyes, Khalid's eyes, gleam. I got stop there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, that, that was quite amazing. Um, I understand that my microphone makes a lot of noise, so I keep getting muted. So, but I do want to tell you, all of us, everyone in the audience, was moved by what you are, by by both of your stories, by both of your memories, stories. They seem so true. How is it though that you write? You came to write them in English when the experiences are clearly in Hebrew. <laughs> yeah, who should uh, who should go first? Um, go first, I guess. Uh, I get it. Okay, I will. Um, wow. Every time I'm asked that, and clearly I, I'm asked that often, <laughs> it's like, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I have so much to say, and for a moment I don't know how to even start or, or what to say. I understand that it's, a, it's, an, it's an odd thing. Um, I'm, I'm aware of it, you know. Um, I don't think it, it's something that I planned or, or imagined that I would do or wanted to do, really. I always knew I wanted to write. I had no, idea, no doubt that that was, you know, my, my passion from a very young age. Uh, I was writing since I was like five. You know, I always wanted to write. I always uh, loved stories. But um, when I moved to Canada, I was 25. Uh, and at first I just fell into this, like, you know, uh, I say sometimes it's like the gap between the languages. I just didn't know how to express myself in, in English well enough, but I wasn't using Hebrew. Um, you know, when I moved to Canada, it was also time before 
when when phone calls were expensive, you know, when social media wasn't didn't exist. So it wasn't there wasn't an easy way for me to to use Hebrew at all. I didn't know Israelis around. Um, so suddenly I was kind of thrusted into a life in English um, that I wasn't ready for. Um, and whether you like it or not, when that happens, you know, uh, your, your mother tongue also uh, can ent atrophy, uh, even, you know, um, if you don't use it. And that's what started to happen for me. And I guess a few years later, um, English started making itself known uh, in my writing. Um, and it wasn't even really writing, it was kind of like journal, diary entries, just like some thoughts, like some fragmented stuff, because I, I, I again, still couldn't imagine that I would ever um, take on something as big as writing in my second language. Um, I'm trying to make this uh, sh short because it's a long story. Um, but I think, yeah, so first English kind of started to appear. Um, and as it happened, I started to fall in love with it, with the newness of it um, and the distance it afforded me. Um, and the reinvention and the anonymity. Um, and all of that. So, yeah. So I'll, I'll start there kind of, because obviously I can just talk about it for the entire, you know, for the, <laughs> the remaining 40 minutes. Uh, so, so I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna hear from you a little bit, Omel. Um, I'm curious to know your your journey too. Yeah, the, I, I think um, I think in some ways it's, it's pretty similar. And uh, I think like you, it wasn't so much a choice but it felt like it, it kind of happened. Um, I was actually, the first time um, I, I met Ayelet a couple months ago was, it was really fun and it was also special for me because I feel like I never really met anyone who was writing about Israel in English. Uh, so I, I didn't really feel part of um, the scene here in New York with American Jewish writers um, because I'm Israeli and I didn't feel so much part of the scene in Israel where they're writing in Hebrew. Uh, so it was really nice to share <laughs> kind of our experience of it and commiserate a little about our weird place. Um, but <laughs> I, I think um, I think also it, it gives me some distance. I think I, I noticed it obviously retrospectively, it wasn't planned, but it does give me some distance because writing about a place that's so familiar, I think you need you need distance in order to make it uh, new on the page um, and to to make something that seems um, taken for granted the landscape even um, the people and to, to make it something that that you see it uh, with fresh eyes so I think writing in English is a way to do that and in Hebrew it's it's more difficult because because it's my mother tongue and because um, I spent most of my childhood in, in Israel, um, and it, it would be it would be difficult to see it in with new eyes. I think, um, and I mean, yeah, I, I think I think my journey was was similar in a way. I I, I, I did spend a couple years in in um, Princeton in New Jersey when I was when I was a kid, and that's where I learned English. Um, so I was six years old, maybe, and um, it, it, it made me think of it because of your story a little bit, because it was um, it's not not the same uh, uh, time period exactly, but it just it was the first time I took a bus. So it, because of the intifada and stuff like that, I didn't really get on buses in Israel um, when I was a kid. So when I was six, I remember taking the bus for the first time and in um new jersey and i was really excited <laughs> um and yeah so so i think i after spending those years in in the states i where i didn't feel like i belonged so much i think i remember mostly um i didn't speak english at first obviously 
And I remember not understanding what they wanted from me. They, they, we would recite the Pledge of Allegiance every day in the class, and um, and I didn't know, you know. What you would probably like it warmer, though. Uh, <laughs> and um, and I remember not knowing what it was and not saying it, so I was sort of punished and sent to the corner, where there was a table with um, an aquarium with hermit crabs, and I remember not knowing it was a punishment and really liking it you know, with the hermit crabs. Um, so I think some of my first feelings were feelings of uh, being a stranger um, and not belonging. And maybe that's part of the reason why I write in English about Israel. Because when I came back to Israel, I also felt a bit, a bit strange because now I'd spent some time in, in the States. So both places are kind of strange for me in some ways. No. I think you're muted. Okay. Uh, we still you're still Karen, muted, Karen. Karen. We don't hear you, Karen. We can't hear you because I I keep unmuting and then I get muted. Re muting. <laughs> uh, but that's one of the problems of writing in English. You can get keep getting re muted. <laughs> what what kinds of, of uh, advantages do you think that writing in English gives you? I mean, it gives you perspective certainly on on different uh, you know, your, your your past, different experiences. Here, the experiences are much more dramatic um, in Israel, but there's mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of advantage to writing in English. Uh, for some, yeah. what do you um, think? I can I can uh, answer. I think I, I started saying some of those things, but there's there are, there are there are more. Um, I think now that I first of all I live in Israel now, and it's funny. Even like I I hear it in my accent, like it that it was, you know. When I was reading the story now, I struggled a little more, you know, reading like pronouncing. Um, you know, when I was living in, in Canada, obviously, um, accent is a dynamic thing as we, you know, you probably know, Omel, you know, when you're tired, your accent is stronger. Uh, if you're inebriated, your accent is stronger. <laughs> so, uh, so also being here uh, it changes it. Um, but I found that for me, um, when I came back to Israel, I was really worried about uh, my English writing. I was worried that I was going to lose it. You know, I'm like I'm, that's it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be. I finally, sort of, I got it, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm not gonna be as, as, I'm not gonna have as fluency as, as I used to. That's something I really worried about. Um, I, I realized then that it maintains the same sort of distance that before I had also by living abroad, right? Because the distance is not just the language. When you live in Canada or in the US, uh, as you do, Omer, you get the distance, the physical distance, the geographical distance, and another you know, uh, benefit, uh, I think, to writing about Israel, uh, seeing it, you know, kind of thing and uh, whatever. Um, so I realized that by writing in English, I kind of managed to maintain that kind of distance, uh, even when I live here. You know, I still have that one layer uh, of it um, remaining. So that's that's one advantage. Uh, the other thing for me was, yeah, I felt like I was, I sort of fled into it. I was, you know, into into English, uh, and it gave me uh, freedom. You know. Um, Similarly, again, to the experience of immigration, you know, where you can reinvent yourself, you can become a different person, you can become a different writer, you can say things you didn't, uh, you couldn't say uh, uh, before, you can be things you couldn't be before. Um, and, and there is something to the fact that my mom doesn't read English, I have to say, that's a part of it, when I'm talking about that, you know, uh, the freedom. 
but yeah, it felt, even though it's, you know, one of the most spoken languages in the world, to me, it felt like a secret language, you know, like I, I felt like, um, yeah, like I could just be wild uh, and take risks. Um, and that is, that was really appealing to me when I started writing uh, in English. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to you, Omar. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree. Um, and it's it's really interesting the kind of uh, things you can do in English that are maybe blocked in Hebrew. And I think um, it's also not it's I think it's not as simple as just writing in English because our English is different from someone who grew up in in America, for example. Absolutely. So we have some of the rhythms of Hebrew and some of the phrases which maybe sound a little strange to an American ear but that's what also makes them you know a little different and um, so I think it's it's not really letting go completely of Hebrew and of uh, obviously with subject matter and writing about Israel but also I think in terms of the rhythms of the language and making because I think English especially kind of uh, a lot of these um, kind of post-colonial writers Salman Rushdie or um who who create a new kind of english that uses you know rhythms from other languages words from yeah. other languages so i think um it's it, it makes it um to, to me at least more interesting it's not a, a choice of either this or that but a kind of okay let's see what we can do with english that has a special kind of um resonance of hebrew to it yeah uh, right <laughs> yeah it's like infused with, yeah. with yeah um there's an anecdote i just have to share about uh alexander Heyman, uh mm -hmm. who's a I bosnian writer who writes in his second language and i remember he, he uh, his wife read his work and said to him you can't you know about some phrase he used she said you can't use you can't say that in english and he said you can now yeah <laughs> I love yeah that. you have the <laughs> you can kind of create new ways of yeah um yeah should i should i dare i ask you if you think differently i mean i know that you know i'm gonna ask that or someone's gonna ask you think differently in hebrew how oh, no. much um yeah i mean i guess i guess i do um i think sometimes when i'm with someone who doesn't speak hebrew and i'm speaking to my parents or something and um i'm speaking in hebrew they they say that it's yeah like a different side of me or um so i think diff it's it's the language to me is in some ways more intimate um because it's my mother tongue and you know what i speak with my family and things like that um so maybe some of it is uh more connected to to childhood for me <laughs> whereas english mm -hmm. feels kind of like my adult language in some ways um i don't know yeah it's it would be interesting if people as they grew older they changed language the other language for childhood and language for adulthood and language for old age or something but I, I think people people do that with their I think there's maybe I mean your vocabulary changes um I think it's the the most interesting I think um part of it is not really the how you think but actually in your dreams I think my dreams in Hebrew are definitely different from my dreams in English um, and it confuses me to wake up if I have a dream in Hebrew and I wake up in New York I, <laughs> I'm always pretty good. You know what language it is? Because I, I don't <laughs> know that I know that. I, um, sometimes I remember, sometimes I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or, or even, I guess one of the weirder things is if you have a dream about friends who only speak Hebrew with you and then they're speaking. And you're English speaking. You. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because yeah. I wanted to say that for me, it feels like, it's a, it's a great question, but I, it's not, it's very fluid. Like I, I consider myself a made 
bilingual. Obviously, I wasn't born into it. I'm not as bilingual as my child. But um, the other day, we were walking down the street, and a neighbor ran into us and heard us, and she's like, oh, you speak English amongst yourselves? And we looked at each other. was like, oh, we, yeah, we didn't notice. You know, we, we had no idea what language we were talking. So in a sense, we it kind of fluidly shifts. Um, and I feel like the dreams are like that too. I, I would speak Hebrew to people who speak English, like half the dream doesn't have any language at all. And it just kind of, it, 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 we start sentences in this house in one language and finish in the other. And I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that, you know, being uh, maybe made bilingual yourselves. Um, I, I can't really um, quantify it. You know, I'm sure there, uh, yeah, I, I can. I can't, I really can't, because I don't know that I think in a, in, in a language, you know, or dream in a language. It's kind of a, a mix of, of words in, in both languages and images and, and feelings and, yeah. Mm -hmm. because, you're, because you're both writing fiction, and uh, I think both of you start with memoirs, memories no uh ayala you started with memoir oh no i no 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 the my mem the memoir was my second book actually and, and actually you began with poetry right me oh no oh. <laughs> <laughs> i i i wrote the couple poems <laughs> <laughs> uh, does fiction come first for you both uh, um, and is the fiction always about Israel? It is, okay. Um, did fiction come first? I have to say that my first, my very first writing in English was actually nonfiction. Uh, that's because I was so intimidated by the idea. Fiction is my first love. I've written fiction as a, you know, I've written fiction as a child. Uh, I've written a novel at the age of 15 that was never published, but I've always loved fiction. But then um, when I came, when I started writing in English, I was so intimidated by the idea of writing in uh, uh, fiction in English that nonfiction seemed like a good, um, compromise at the time it was like um a new language for a new genre or a new genre for a new language kind of thing so i've never done that before right but i was like okay fine i'll just write stories about from my own life because that seemed like uh, easier for some reason uh so that's what i did um and then I remember there was a snow day in Vancouver, which is a rare thing because Vancouver doesn't snow often and the restaurant where I was working closed. And I ended up sitting at home and writing my first short story. And that was like, okay, you know, I wrote a story in English. Uh, and after that, I moved uh, strictly into fiction and I wrote my, my you know, my, my book of uh, fiction, The Best Place on Earth. And then I went back into memoir. Um, Am I only writing about Israel? Mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I was away, when I was living in Canada, uh, it was because probably partially because I missed it. Um, definitely because I could see more clearly, again, the distance, what a fascinating and rich and messed up place it is, which is such a fertile ground for fiction. Um, but yeah, it's also, I think it was a chance for me to also almost almost visit it in my, in my writing, you know? It was like, I would, I would be sitting in, in the cold Toronto night writing about a lot. Uh, <laughs> and it, it was a joy um, for me. Um, and I would say even more specifically for me, it's writing about Israel. And it's usually writing about Mizrahi experience in Israel. Uh, people ask me, are you always going to write about Yemenis? And I'm like, 
so far, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'm not going to sign on something. I don't know what's going to happen. Everything can change. Maybe I will write poetry. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But um, right now, this seems, seems to still fascinate me um, and haunt me. Um, so that's what I do. Um, Omer and Ayelet, might I ask which language you which language you count in? Because of how the linguists say that that is your home language. Do you count in Hebrew or do you count in English? <laughs> Maybe it depends how far, how high up we have to count. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, it depends but how far you have to count. Which would you prefer to count in? I, I honestly would do both. I, yeah. It depends who I'm who I'm with or mm -hmm. yeah uh, where I am. I, yeah. Yeah. Going back to the question about fiction and nonfiction, um, there's um, this this um, quote that Amos Oz uh, said that I that I like, but he said um, that the the word fiction doesn't really exist in Hebrew because it's siporet, which is more like the narrative prose and fiction has the a kind of ring of, of lying to it or you're inventing something um, and he says um, like uh, why why is it considered you know lying or the opposite of truth when James Joyce um, counts counts or measures the steps between the you know his house and in the bar um, and to get to get it right in his fiction um, and when you know a nonfiction uh, writer, writes something that's more kind of a uh, cliche like the the melting pot of the middle east or something then it's considered true um so he talks about kind of the the difference i guess between a, a kind of truth that you can get at through fiction um rather than through kind of nonfiction or the cold facts or something um and i think that's always interested me because i i'm sometimes i'm kind of in some of my stories, at least, I like kind of blurring the, the boundaries between something that's a little more um, fantastical and something that's more realist and kind of create stories that are weird and sometimes um, absurd or um, a little magical in some ways. Um, but I think it's also a way of sometimes getting at a kind of truth, even if it's an emotional truth rather than uh, something that's actually um, historically accurate but um yes yeah, so, so i guess i'm interested in those questions i, I haven't really written that much nonfiction, some essays and things um but um i find it hard i think to write directly about myself and, and my experiences so i think fiction the distance of it like the distance of english as a language for me actually helps me write something that's more intimate because i can sort of uh invent characters and um, situations, um, but get at sort of emotional truths that are more um, intimate to me than all the feelings that my characters feel, you know, I felt in some way, even if it's uh, disguised a little bit. <laughs> uh, certainly, certainly Joyce needed that perspective as well. There are people, I have to tell you, there are people who want to ask you questions. And they have all turned to Michael uh, because he is fielding the questions. And feel, Michael has this, is, is full of questions for you. Um, and I will, I'm going to turn the evening over to Michael, uh, who will be asking uh, everyone's questions. Uh, and I hope, maybe I'll have a chance to ask some too at the end. But first. So that, that was wonderful. And uh, I have a question here from uh, Erica. Um, um, it's prompted by Omer's comments, uh, opening comments about fitting in the, in the scene in New York. Could Omer and Ayelet comment further on the reception of their very Israeli work in the broader Anglophone literary community? beyond Jewish press and Jewish awards and Jewish uh, expats and Jewish Israeli, you know, uh, how, how does the general non-Jewish public or non-Israeli public accept your work? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I, I did want the stories to 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 be approachable to to anyone, uh, not not necessarily only Israelis or only Jews. Uh, and I think there is this kind of, uh, I mean, some of the work that I like the most, and I think this is true for Ayelet's work and writers like Jhumpa Lahiri who uh, have a very kind of um, micro, like kind of local uh, zooming in of a, a place, and but it feels very universal. Um, so I think that that's kind of the work that I like the most. Um, so I'm hoping that, yeah, it resonates with other, um, you know, other audiences. Um, I think, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's interesting and mostly to hear the kind of either reviews or the questions from um, sort of critics or, or audiences that aren't uh, necessarily Jewish or Israeli. And I think a lot of it is the focus in a way on the political. Um, whereas maybe from an Israeli um, audience, the politics is kind of a given in a way. And so we can sort of see <laughs> a bit deeper and not, not kind of um, resort only to um, these kinds of uh, uh, questions that flatten the work and make it only into this kind of um, thing that, that's about the, the, the situation or something like that. And, and you can kind of, um, I think, look at, at the different aspects and the different facets of, of the work that, that aren't only political, because I think a lot of Israeli writers face that that kind of challenge of their work is sometimes, you know, flattened into only, this is only about politics and what's your stance on this? And what do you think of that? And, um, and I think obviously maybe, maybe there is, you know, a kind of, um, there, there is something we have to keep in mind when we're writing, um, but I think the goal isn't to convince anyone of anything, uh, obviously, and, and you're not kind of writing a political manifesto, but you're, you're creating characters and, complex situations. Um, so, so I think, I guess that, that was my experience sometimes with, um, with the, the non-Jewish or non-Israeli um, audiences is, is the focus tended to be a little bit more on, on the political. I don't know if you had that too, Um I this, this is something I was really worried about before I wrote the book. When I first like, started to write in English, I didn't write about Israel so much. Um, I was, you know, I, I think I, wa I wanted to and I, I was scared. Uh, I thought, yeah, like it's, you know, uh, it's going to be perceived as political. It's going to be like, I'm going to be inundated with, with questions about politics. I'm like, I didn't want to touch that, you know, uh, at all. Um, but first of all, like we said before, it wasn't much of a choice writing in English. It was also, it's also not really much of a choice that the topics and the stories and the characters and the voices uh, that do end up uh, on the page, at least for me, it's, it's a lot of it is just, you know, uh, it just happens. Um, and it was very clear to me at one point that this is what I needed to write. This is what I was uh, driven to write, compelled to write. Um, and, you know, I, I, I need to be uh, brave <laughs> uh, and take the risk and, and write what I really want to write, write my truth, like you said, you know, uh, in fiction. Um, one of the quotes that I loved at the time and I still love is the one by Cynthia Ozek, who says that when you uh, blow into the narrow end of the shofar, of the shofar uh, you know, you will be, you will like, I, I forgot it now. If you choose, if you blow into the narrow, narrow end of the shofar, you're not going to be heard. Uh, but if you blow into the, no, you will be heard far, but if you blow into the, the wide one, because you want to be mankind and not be Jewish and not be Israeli and not be you, then you're not going to be heard at all. That's what it was. Uh, mm -hmm. And that quote to me was really monumental. I was like, okay, you know, I can't uh, please everyone. I can't, um, you know, I, 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 I just have to do me uh, and I have to write my truth and I have to write the stories that speak to me and the stories that um, haunt me. And that's what I do. Thank you, Mark. If we blow into the narrow end of the shofar, we will be heard far. But if we choose to be mankind rather than Jewish, we will not be heard at all. So um, as, a, as a professional shofar blower myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you attest I, to it being true? Yeah, absolutely <laughs> true. I can attest to that. Um, our organization is the Israeli Association of Writers in English. And 
I think everybody, and this is mistaken, but I think everybody um, in the organization are immigrants who have come to live in Israel, who write in English, their mother language, and, and we form a an organization to hold them and to promote them and to help them and to help them find a home. You're both back in Israel. Are you seen as betraying your language, like your Israelis writing in English? Do you want to become members of our organization? Are you going back to write in Hebrew? Are you, you know, how does that work? Um, how do Israelis see you? Have they read your work in Hebrew? Has it been translated? Uh, there must be a tension there. Yeah, there is. Uh, Omer actually lives in New York. Um, for me, yeah, I actually wanted to, to, first of all, I do want to be a part of your organization. And I am very upset that I have not heard of it <laughs> until now. Uh, it's perfect. I need to be a part of it. That said, yes, there is like, I think what Omer said before, it was like, you know, here, I'm also a bit of an outsider because I am you know, Israeli born, this is my mother tongue. And then, you know, in Israel amongst my, I have friends, I have like a writing community here. I have a literary community, but I am different. I write in English, you know, so I am on the fringes of that as well. Uh, and when my book was translated into Hebrew, I was worried again, just like I was worried before I was writing it in English, whether it would speak to the audiences abroad uh, now I was worried that the Israeli audience is not going to find it authentic, uh, which again speaks to your, to my, to our need to belong, to our need to be, you know, considered uh, a part of something. And I'm like, are people going to read this and say, you know, she got it wrong? What does she know? She lives in Canada, you know. So uh, there's, it, it's kind of a, a constant battle. Um, which is, I'm not complaining about it because I think this is what inspires so much of my work. Probably all of it, you know, this is it. This is the, that, that wanting to belong, that living uh, in between, uh, you know, in liminal spaces, between languages, between identities, between places. This is, I, 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 I live for it <laughs> and in it. <laughs> yeah I, th I think that's um yeah really really great way to to put it it's a kind of in-between space and um i yeah i i don't know it's weird the languages that um my book is is being translated into it's not the ones that i expected it's coming out in turkish in a bit and it came out in dutch you know italian and slovak or something um so it's a bit strange uh, but not hebrew uh, for now um it took me a while too I have <laughs> yeah it took a while other languages yeah. were first yeah and i i think i we we talked about it yeah but the kind of um uh selling coals to newcastle thing um i, I don't know um but i i think yeah like I, if, if it happened if um like her work then mine is also translated then i would also kind of um it would be a different kind of worry than it was here and um and it would be interesting but we'll, you know we'll see what happens <laughs> we have a complaint here <laughs> there is a complaint by someone who says that you use too much hebrew in your writing i haven't read your writing i have to admit it's not me um and wishes that there was a glossary of um of of, of words omer or me or both oh, omer, slicha, omer. oh yeah <laughs> <Slicha>. <laughs> Yeah. that only means something in Hebrew without a glossary, like uh, or uh, I mean, there are words that in, if you translate them, they lose everything. So I agree. losing the, this is, this is the, the place that seems the most problematic, that, that place that gets lost in any kind of translation when you, when you, you know, there, there are words in Yiddish that you can't use in any other language. There's words in Yemeni that you can't translate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that, that whatever the complaint was, mm -hmm. it's got to stay a complaint because these are, uh, 
you're bringing out a culture that is within that cannot be translated. Uh, you, there are things in in, uh, in your background that cannot be uh, that cannot be translated into other languages. But do you write in, in about New York at all, Amel? Uh, not yet. I, I think I think it is interesting about having the Hebrew words in um, in there. I think uh, yeah. I think I was sort of thinking or, or worried about writing a book that would feel like I had said inauthentic, or that would feel like some kind of uh, tourist guide to to Israel. And I didn't I didn't want that kind of work. Um, so, so I think it is a balance. I mean, you you want the non-Hebrew speaking audiences to understand, maybe through context, maybe some words you know they'll miss here and there. But um, I think I'd prefer that to a book that feels too um, I don't know, kind of pandering, maybe to to a different audience. But but keeping a kind of um, uh, yeah, so some of the. Um, of the authenticity and that includes the language, I guess. Um, but no, I, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't written about New York yet. Um, and I'm not sure I will. I, I think like I, let's, um, there's enough going on in Israel to keep us writing for years, you know, <laughs> you know never boring, so. Are audiences surprised in America, are audiences surprised when you uh, reveal yourself as Israelis because you don't sound like Israelis, you're, you, you're accentless. I mean, you don't have thick Israeli accents. I mean, it, it, it's pretty good. I mean, you can get away with being almost native, uh, native not here, native there. Are people then surprised, whoa, you're Israelis? Um, it, it's, it varies. There were people who could send, and, and like I said, my accent is thicker now, uh, but it varied. You know, there were people who knew right away, they heard it, people with better ears maybe, and there are others who were like, oh, wow, we, we're sure you were, you know, born here. Um, there were other responses though, right? Like people who assume that Israelis look a certain way or Jews look a certain way, you know, or were confused by my Yemeni identity or it was all like, you know, just there's a lot of ignorance around that um which is a part of what i was you know uh i guess hoping to to change a little bit with my my book my books really uh writing about a different kind of jewishness than what most uh american americans know or canadians and expect mm -hmm. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I guess it's it's a good disguise sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I wonder sometimes actually if if a very thick accent would be a a better kind of shield actually, because yeah. you know, they <laughs> sometimes you can hide behind it a little. Yeah, but, yeah uh, I hear you. <laughs> I, I know this is changing the subject, but perhaps you would like to read a little more. Uh, um, would you like to read something else, Ayelet and Omel? Uh, because we'd love to hear you in the accent. Um, I have to leave uh, in about seven minutes, uh, but I have a paragraph that I can read um, that I quite like. Um, if you, um, if you allow me. It's from the title story. Um, I'll find it. And it's a story that takes place in Hornby Island in Vancouver, uh, near Vancouver. Um, two sisters, one lives there and one is coming to visit her from Jerusalem. And give me one sec. There we go. After breakfast, she asked to use the computer to check the news. Please don't, Kamal said. You're on vacation. She had stopped reading news from Israel years ago. She said it's all bad anyway. Nomi turned on the computer, typing in Ynet's URL. A pigua in Jerusalem. Ten injured. Nobody dead. 
For a moment, you could see how her country might look to a Canadian, how Jerusalem could be perceived as the worst place to live, raise a family, a dangerous, troubled city torn between faith, a hotbed for fanatics and fundamentalists. Ten years ago, on their visit to Vancouver, Naomi and Ami had asked Amal to take them out. They had been younger then, intoxicated by the sense of freedom new parents experienced on their first vacation away from their child. Let's party all night, Ami said. This isn't Jerusalem. There's no all night here, Tamal said. Well, that sucks. Maybe, but it's also safe and civilized. Safe, Ami scoffed, overrated. They all laughed. Later, he said to Naomi, maybe people in Vancouver don't party as much because their lives are too comfortable. You know, the whole drink, dance, and be merry because tomorrow you might die kind of thing. Maybe there's something good about knowing it could all end at any minute. She had thought he was being morbid, but now it made sense. She was so used to living in a constant state of urgency, verging on emergency. No wonder the quiet made her uneasy. She looked at the screen. Israeli soldiers and paramedics frozen in mid-action, their faces grim and alert. The carcass of a car, broken pieces of twisted metal, dark stain on asphalt, she didn't miss this, yet she couldn't even fathom living anywhere else. It's too much, Tamal had said to her on her last visit. It's just too intense for me. She was right, Naomi had thought. Sometimes it was too much. She loved and hated Jerusalem, a city that would forever be contested, forever divided, never at peace. But there was more to Jerusalem than what one saw in the news, like how beautiful it was. Not in the way BC was, but in a hard, raw, and broken way. How oh, it felt alive, a kind of beast, pulsating, breathing, vibrating under her feet. How oh, sometimes when she walked through the old city and saw tourists snapping photos and looking at everything with, with awe, she would see Jerusalem through their eyes and be reminded that people used to walk there 2,000 years ago in togas. And it would make her feel small and insignificant, but in a good way. How at times the city truly felt sacred, magical, the center of everything. Like at sunset when the sun reflected crimson and gold on the limestone and the dome of the rock shone like a rare amber in the middle of the city. Or on a winter night when it snowed and everything was briefly muted and still, the sharp edges softened. Or how on Friday evening when the buses disappeared into the jaws of Central Station to park for Shabbat and the Hasidic neighborhoods blocked the roads from traffic, and everywhere smelled of home-cooked dinners. It felt like the most peaceful city in the world, the best place on earth. Thank you. That was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I, I can read a little bit from a story um, called The Sephardi Survivor. It's about two brothers who are uh, Sephardi and, and they're very jealous of their uh, classmates who have relatives that are Holocaust survivors. So they kidnap an old man and pretend he's their grandfather for uh, Memorial Day. Um, I'll read a little bit of that. When the competitions were held at school, the grandfathers and grandmothers were paraded around like slow moving trophy dogs. Look at that one, Zal said, pointing at Clara Kugelmas's grandmother a tiny elderly lady with rouged lips and a purple cane. He nudged Judah in the ribs. Not bad looking, eh? Yechezkel Yankelovich brought in two survivors, double trouble, twin sisters with matching silver braids who had been experimented on by Dr. Mengele. Dana Davinson brought in her grandfather's second cousin, a beanpole who had testified at Eichmann's trial. The best survivors of all were so shrunken, they were almost pocket sized. They were carried around from event to event, pulled out at the last minute and used as excuses for not completing homework on time. I'm sorry I couldn't study because I was listening to my grandfather's Shoah story was a common reason for failing a math test. Our sworn enemy was Matan Mordechai Mendelbaum, who always had the best Shoah story. His grandfather was not only a survivor, he was also a respected historian, a world specialist in the field whose books on the Shoah had won awards and prizes. The Mendelbaum home was filled with shelves of his books, 
translated into dozens of different languages, all with swastikas on the cover. I imagined all the Mendelbaum sitting together at the breakfast table, picking at crusts of baguette and expensive smoked salmon, quoting their favorite parts of Schindler's List to each other. And I was so jealous I wanted to wring Matan Moldechai Mendelbaum's neck. Thankfully, the Elvis of the Holocaust, as Mendelbaum frequently referred to his grandfather, didn't live in Israel. My brother and I would have surely lost if he were coming to class to tell his story. He's also up there. <laughs> you guys, you kill me. Uh, my grandson, I have a grandson named Omo, and if you're interested, I, uh, let me just uh, no, notify you that next month uh, our guest is uh, Robert Pinsky. Uh, and then in two months, we're going to, uh, Sarah Sussman is going to talk to uh, Roni Somek about. Uh, oh, wonderful. We're going to have a lot of, a lot of inter, uh, interlingual things. Uh, and I hope that uh, you will be able to join us. We have, because uh, <laughs> you're great. You guys are great. <laughs> great. I'm sure that we're this is, this is the beginning of a great friendship for mm -hmm. all of us. Uh, so, so I know there are more questions, but I wonder if we can uh, uh, do this in correspondence. Because I think many of them are very uh, uh, repetitious. And Ayala has, I know that you have to leave and you're being very polite. Yes. So, <laughs> Thank you very much. A Canadianist. Wonderful, wonderful evening. And thank you to all the audience who managed to get through all my uh, uh, scheduling mistakes. <laughs> thank you. And now that my necklace is gone, uh, <laughs> we, will, we will end the evening and hope to see you next week, next month. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Omel. Good Bye. night. Bye. You can go off. You can go off mute and thank our speakers if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.